and confirm, Polina, you can see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Fantastic. Okay, well, welcome everyone, and Polina, uh, thank you, and welcome to Copy, Writing Essentials for Authoring On-Screen Content and Narration Scripts. Uh, this is uh, lesson number three, and uh, thank you all for attending. We, I really appreciate you being here and being part of this discussion. Uh, this is an exciting week as we get further into uh, the trenches of developing e-learning content, and thank you to iSpring for hosting these. So let's get through some obligatory uh, screens. I call them my obligatory self-brag. Uh, so a little about me. I, uh, my name is Michael Shiashi. I'm with uh, a and a technologist. I have a bachelor's in film, a uh, bachelor's in Native American studies, and a master's of fine arts in 3D modeling for video games and simulation. I've been working in IT and e-learning for 20 years now, uh, and I've almost got it right now. So uh, I appreciate these. These are exciting for me to uh, talk with you all and be a part of the community uh, and discuss things. And so as we look at some of the items uh, that we've talked about last week, so I'll talk about last week's number two. Uh, we, we talked about SME roles. We talked about the pipeline and process. We tried to define what a SME was. Uh, we looked at definitions and, and who SMEs might be on your team. Uh, remember that they're experts or they have expertise and sometimes they're geniuses and sometimes they're not. And remember as instructional design people uh, or developers, we are sometimes the SMEs as well. And that was a uh, not necessarily a revelation, but a good reminder for us all to consider ourselves because any of the SMEs, including ourselves, are important to the overall success. And like any other asset, like artists or graphics or programming, we're missing out if we don't utilize those SMEs and other roles uh, as to the best of their ability. And many have diverse backgrounds and such. So, But last week we talked about our real role, uh, and that is being learner advocates, uh, being champions for the learners and creating content for them and making sure that we would want to take this same content if we had to do so. Uh, we even talked about ways to compress and capture SME knowledge where possible and where available. Uh, using video capture or audio capture, allowing the SME to have some level of control uh, and some uh, buy-in and some face-to-face -face time uh, with the learners directly. Uh, in these, of course, using ice creams, capture, author, uh, audio, and video. So we also talked about what to do if there's too much information or more information that needed to be shared on one screen. For those of you who remember a couple of weeks back, the video I shared, uh, you know, the movie uh, Starship Troopers, Would You Like to Know More? Um, this showing how iSpring interactions uh, could do that, having a lot of information, information, a lot of information, and allowing someone to drill down into it uh, as needed. So there's a lot of different things. So as I mentioned, we're in week three, and today we'll be talking about writing essentials uh, and for both on-screen content and narration. Next week we'll be talking about uh, actually taking what we created this week and capturing it both in audio and video and editing it. Uh, then in the following weeks, we'll talk about uh, assessment and quizzes. We'll talk about creating more interactive, branching, immersive content. Uh, we'll talk about best practices for the learner experience and, and the interface. Uh, we'll look at things to polish up your content. Uh, and then we'll look at ways at, at publishing and sharing. And finally, in the last week, we'll actually showcase some really great uh, demos and demonstration examples. So here's what we can talk about today. And one thing I didn't mention, so as we go through these, and yes, this is the obligatory objective slides that we all love to develop and design. Uh, however, what I wanted to mention, as we go through these, I want to invite each and every one of you to make sure that you use the discuss buttons, use the chat button, uh, and be part of this discussion with us um, and submit any ideas or questions as we go along. Uh, Polina will stop me and um, say, hey, we have a really important question. So please utilize that function as we go through. So today we'll be talking about, of course, on-screen text and content. Uh, we'll be talking about how to craft and author narration scripts. We'll also look at some tips you can give for your narrators, and we'll take a look at some things you can need to consider when putting audio on the screen. Uh, so before I get into the meat of this, so Polina, I, I believe we have a our first question. Can we go ahead and um, submit that to the group? Um, sure, but which one would you like me to submit? <laughs> Let me double check my notes. So uh, the who does the writing on the e-learning okay. for number one. Perfect. Let me launch the poll for you guys. And so the question is, who does the writing for the learning you create? 
Is it you? Is it your clan or somebody similar? Is it the member of your team, possibly? If you could take a, take a moment and vote for the right answer for you, for yourself, please do so. Or if you have any other answer, you're more than welcome to share in the question box, and we would love to see. Right, that's a great reminder. So, as Polina said, if you do have uh, one um, answer that doesn't fit or have more than one answer, uh, feel free to answer the best, but certainly use the chat function uh, because we'd love to know what's going on with you guys. So, and All right, let's leave that open. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, before, uh, so just so you know, uh, when we have the poll open, no one can see your screen. It's just the poll question. So, I will have to close it and. I will do it about now and then share the results. So it looks okay, like, taking a look now. yeah, mostly we have people who, who write themselves. Right. And so that's, that's about how it goes. And so I'm in the same boat with many of you. So I have both created uh, authoring and, and, and created on-screen text. Uh, I've served as technical writer in some cases for both what we used to call CBTs, computer-based computer -based training. Uh, I've authored a, an actual print book uh, with a publisher. So I'm familiar with crafting these various text writings and such. So uh, I completely understand and been down in the trenches with you all as well. So let me get back to my full screen where I'm not staring at myself. So. As you know, when we look at things on screen, we need to be succinct. We need to make sure that we provide information in a concise manner. We have a limited area in physical, well, not physical, but in digital dimensions usually, and sometimes physical if you do manuals as well. Um, but we have a very limited space by which we need to have our information and, and clearly communicate our ideas to our learner. Uh, and of course, so, not being wordy is important. Make sure that in this being concise that you have the core information, less is more. Uh, and of course, we couldn't have a discussion on writing for the screen without chunking, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, so looking at you know how much text should I actually put on screen, uh, there's a lot of good information out there. So the short answer is really not too much. And so what does that mean? Well, um, we'll look at it in a moment. So let's take a look at this. Is a, the link is below, and this is, I'll pull this up. This is a really great uh, little tidbit out on Learning Solutions Magazine where the, the classic learner interface errors where it talks about how much uh, on-screen text is available. And you can, uh, the link is available and you can look at it yourself. But uh, this talks about some of the ouchies and, and some of the no-nos to do. And filling your screen with text is very obviously a no-no. Uh, and so here's sort of the little examples that might be hard to see on your screen, but the link's available. So. Uh, when we talk about distilling down information, uh, we take a lot of information, whether it's from our SMEs or from our um, curriculum, and we, succinct be, we, we distill it down into its core concept, and we provide that core concept uh, to our learners. So what that can also mean uh, is that we need to provide that additional information. So while you may not have you know, the 3,000 characters on screen, you may only have 149 characters, uh, or whatever the Twitter character limit is, um, on screen, uh, you may still be able to augment or support that information with audio, with the drill down information, the would you like to know more information, uh, things, but we don't want to fill up the screen with text. And I think you all know that, but that's just an important idea. So how do we actually uh, distill down that information? Well, more than likely, many of us are familiar with chunking, uh, and I call that not only chunking, but using comments. Sense. So the idea of chunking, of course, is the basic function is taking a lot of content, a lot of information, and compressing it down into bite-sized chunks, something that's easy to consume for our learner. So there's a lot of different aspects you can go out and look for. Um, again, resources like the eLearning Guild, eLearning Industry, ATD. There's a lot of great information about how to write out there. But this is just sort of an overview to remind you that, of course, we need to take a lot of information and chunk it down smaller. Many of you may also be familiar with um, the mobile device first or mobile first development and design process, wherein uh, you may also have heard of it uh, akin to responsive design. Uh, and while it's like responsive design, meaning we design with the idea that content will be will look good on all screens, 
uh, mobile device first or mobile first uh, allows us to s make sure we design for the smallest, the lowest uh, dimensions available first to make sure it looks good. So we might not target all devices, but we may focus primarily on the smaller device first to make sure the, the lowest common denominator screen-wise uh, is the uh, most access or you know most visible. So and this can be content tr content driven, meaning. Uh, as you look on your small device, whether it's a tablet or a phone or what have you, uh, or even watches perhaps, so um, smart watches. So it needs to be one that the content itself is visible on that mobile device. So uh, I'd encourage many of you to go out and look at the mobile first design aspects. There's a lot of great resources available. Um, but as we begin developing, we want to make sure that it looks good on the smallest device first and then going up. And a great way to do that, of course, is using iSpring's preview uh, in the presentation preview as you're publishing or in just the preview up top. Uh, you can look and see how it look, uh, you know, your content looks on various devices, including desktop, tablet, and smartphone. So I encourage you to use this early, early on in your development process when you begin creating stuff. But we want to also see how the text itself looks uh, as we go forward. So let me take a quick look at my notes because I want to make sure we get the questions in. So uh, let's talk about on-screen text. So, Polina, can we put the other question up? The second question about feedback from learners? Sure, just a second. Okay. All right. So, can you see it? I can see it. All right. Is this the right one? <laughs> it is. So, as we talk about what's best for our learners, and so Polina, I'll go ahead and just talk about this question. So what I want us to do is in the chat. So please share any feedback you've received from your learners, specifically about on-screen text. Have you ever had your learners or a, um, a QA group say, man, this is a lot of text, or you know what, I, I this is just the surface level information, I need more. So did you have too much, too little, just right? So as we continue on, be sure and share that in the chat. Okay, so you all continue to share that in chat, and Polina, let me go ahead and, and move on through the conversation. Sure, and let me please return the presenter rights back to you. <laughs> it's like a tennis match, we go back and forth. Yeah, so some people say that uh, they have just right amount of information, some say that it's a little too much, and some say that they get a little, uh, too little feedback to actually analyze, I guess, if it's too little or too much. And that's, and so I, I'm not, so that's actually a very interesting uh, point. So both that, you know, I'm glad that people have gotten feedback, but those that said they, they actually don't get much feedback, that's an important aspect. And I think we all would love to have more feedback. So maybe um, the, the feedback that the learners provide doesn't, they don't know that they can say this too little or too much text. So maybe as we develop, we begin uh, finding a, a real case scenario of learners, a real pool of learners to go in and say, look, take a look at this. Is it too much, too little? Uh, but that's pretty interesting, actually. So um, I think we've all had those where what is that unique balance and, and how do we develop it? Um, so it, it's one of those, as you've seen from the feedback, uh, sometimes it's too much. Sometimes people want more. Uh, and it really depends on the learner and the content itself. Um, you know, what's best for the learner and what does the content uh, facilitate and necessitate. So. And and one interesting, a... just wanted to share quickly, uh, really interesting coming from Stephanie. Right amount of info on screen, but too much with talking narration. That's a good point. So let's talk about that. I actually wanted to talk about that. That actually leads me into this. So when we're developing um, narration script, there's a lot of things we want to consider, and I'll get to that, so please remind me of that. So um, a couple of things. I jokingly say the acronym KISS, and for those of us that have familiar with this statement, um, maybe we've heard it as a, a childhood, keep it simple, stupid. Or if you're in sales, keep it simple, salesperson. But, you know, I'll just say keep it simple, somebody. Uh, we really want to keep our writing for speaking simple, meaning – we may have very concise or, or even times medical or scientific information that needs to be uh, consumed by our learner, uh, but we may have those core aspects or uh, verbose information on screen in visual text information, but our speaking and narration scripts need to be ones that 
are a little bit more common language or at least uh, easier, number one, for the uh, narr narrator to speak and both to be heard. And jokingly uh, with that, I will say acronyms can be very can be very big obstacles. And I jokingly say that after just using one, call, you know, the KISS example of acronyms. Uh, having worked uh, for uh, training for air, uh, air traffic controllers, uh, and so we had a lot of different acronyms that we had to use. Uh, and depending on the narrator, when you were creating the, the script, it may, you'd have to know your narrator, whether they knew those ac acronyms or not, and sometimes they didn't. But these need to be laid out in the script process uh, and understood. And you can do that directly in the script, or you can talk with your narrator, whomever that might be. Uh, important aspect that we sometimes forget when narrating and creating um, scripts for narration is transitional phrasing. Some examples include, now that we have learned such and such, or now that we understand this, or now we will talk about this. Another example might be, let's examine the following, or let's examine this idea. Or even something as simple as, all right, let's shift gears. So now that we've talked about this slide, so let's shift gears. These are interesting tips, uh, tips so understand that uh, there's even something as simple as just using the right phrasing to introduce the new topic or introduce your sense, sentence will help quite a bit. Uh, and lastly, and I think we all know this, is as soon as you write a narration script, get feedback from others. Um, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've had to rewrite scripts, uh, even at the end, even after receiving a lot of input. So it's important that you understand and include this in your pipeline and process uh, within the timeline. Uh, and we've talked about this constantly within the project, whether it's for our clients or internally. We need to understand that rewrites happen. We need to understand because of that sometimes re-records happen for our narrators. Um, but make sure you get input and feedback early and that you're constantly revising and getting the best out there. So some things you can do, of course, visually when you're writing the scripts is, is include spacing, which would indicate pausing for your narrating um, voiceover artist or others uh, or emphasis or bold. These are things that you uh, create and then talk about with your narrator and agree upon so that they understand the internal meaning. So back to the point that we talked about earlier, exactly how much audio should you have? And there's a fantastic um, article I'll share here. Let me go to my so actually from the eLearning Solution magazine again. So how much narration should you use? Uh, and so the, the answer, of course, and you could read this whole thing, it's it's actually very interesting. So someone did a study about how much they use. The answer is, of course, you know, just enough. So we don't want to narrate everything. Uh, again, many of you have, and maybe even in my slide deck, uh, have been inundated with death by PowerPoint. So you have someone uh, presenting a PowerPoint slide and they read every single three, every bullet point, every paragraph on screen. So we don't want to do that. Remember, we talked about being a learner advocate. We don't want to do that to ourselves. We don't want to sit through that sort of training or presentation. We want we don't want to do that and give that to our learners. So again, common sense tells us we don't want to narrate everything, uh, and especially not word for word. Uh, and I jokingly say that even turn down for what, for those of you that may remember the um, song recently uh, from Little John. So. We want to be able to turn that narration off for uh, you know accessibility uh, viewers that are using a screen reader like JAWS. Um, the audio, if it auto plays, will actually interfere with the screen reader and not allow them to get uh, the uh, the needed screen reader uh, caption that they need. So you may even need to turn your audio off or down. So there there's a great balance and delicate balance there between creating this narration that's um, you know easy on the ears, that's something that can be heard, uh, that supports and augments the succinct information you have on screen, but also one um, that can be turned off if needed um, by various learners and still get the full information. So it's a delicate balance. So I'm glad uh, we had that brought up earlier. So uh, within that delicate balance, um, before I get into this, just real quickly, um, we have yet another question. So let me... Uh, Talk about voiceover. So number three, Polina, let's share that if you don't mind. Sure, no problem. All right. How many so of you? Does that, mm -hmm. Is that the one? Please continue. Mm -hmm. Please. How many of you have used yourself as a voiceover narration talent recording? Right. So the question is, so how many of you have to either have to do your own voiceover or have done it before? Uh, and I have had that experience. So share your information in the chat when you can. And as we do that, I'll also talk about some 
real quick and easy tips for speakers. And if we go to the previous point, we have a very interesting point from Dira. I've had learners tell us that they read faster than the narration, so they would prefer no narration at all. Right, and that's so, and that's an excellent point. And I, I actually follow that and, and subscribe to that myself. Um, I do a lot of, uh, I, you know, I view a lot of stuff on YouTube, whether it's doing my stuff at home, um, you know, fixing my car, fixing some electronics. Uh, and so, you know, we would jokingly call that just-in-time training, uh, but I can't tell you how happy I now am that YouTube videos and other videos have the speed. You can adjust the speed to double, uh, because as many of you kind of, as that alludes to, our learners are probably very intelligent, they can read the screen, and so the audio not keeping up with their internal uh, speed is quite, it creates a lot of dissonance. Uh, so. I, I love the YouTube speed button because I take everything at double speed uh, and so it gets to the point quicker. So that's a fantastic uh, point. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and then we have a lot of people saying that either yes, they have, or no, I have done narrations, voiceovers myself. I usually use a professional narrator. Very good. Okay, so I will go back to sharing my screen. So uh, many of us may have had uh, the experience of being a VO or voiceover artist. I'll show my screen, here we go. Um, and so some of us have been lucky enough to hire professional talent, and I, I say lucky, I should probably throw that in quotation marks. Uh, so as you know, there are great benefits from hiring voiceover talent as well uh, as some fault, you know, some inherent uh, traps and such. So uh, you may get someone that's fantastic, uh, that does it great, does it right the first time every time, or you may get someone that you have to work with each and every time, and, and that's just the luck of the draw sometimes, or sometimes it's just uh, how it comes out. So some ideas and tips, whether you're doing it or you've hired a, a VO artist. So uh, if you happen to be do it, doing it, you know, get into a quiet place, and we'll get to some of these uh, next week when we specifically talk about recording. Um, but make sure that it's quiet. Um, I've even used uh, in a different location, a different home I was in, a walk-in closet because the clothing helps baffle and muffle some of the noise. Uh, try to make sure that you record in the same day. And again, this is whether you're recording or you're, you're coaching your um, uh, VO artist um, or your talent, um, because voices can change day to day, uh, even from morning to afternoon. Uh, so especially on re-records, those are going to happen where they sound, you know, it's a different day, obviously, but try to get in as much recording time as you can with you or your artist uh, the same day so that the voice itself sounds different. And believe it or not, simple things like lip balm, uh, chapstick, um, providing water, uh, these are things that if any of you have edited audio, you know that, you know, when lips get dry, they begin sticking together, uh, and when the mouth gets dry, it begins not forming words correctly. So so simple tips um, for this, and uh, you can see on screen, I'll also share, there's a really good online uh, resource, six tips for producing good quality audio uh, from the e-learning industry. And again, there's a lot of these really great tips out there. Go out and search, and you'll find that prim primarily, you know, there are several things you can do uh, to actually help create the, a good voiceover recording, um, but these are just some things that sometimes people don't think of, uh, you know, making sure that it's the same day and, and, and having liquid and chapstick. So as I mentioned, there are times when the learner may need to actually remove the audio or turn it down or mute it. So we need to be aware of this, we need to understand it, and we'll talk about best practices for accessibility uh, and for those learners as, as well. Uh, but like I mentioned, those people that use screen readers like JAWS or others, uh, need to be able to get to the information without having the interference of the audio or without having it clash with that. So uh, remember, as we're creating these uh, accessible contents, uh, reusing our scripts, um, fleshing them out if they had a lot of abbreviations, uh, taking out the spacing and pausing, but reformatting them and using them as captions or transcripts for the audio or video, uh, these will be the basis for how we create these and how we prevent uh, provide them on screen, uh, which goes back to getting the input. So understanding when you send it out for input or feedback and getting it back and allowing that information to be concise allows you to have better on-screen text. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, as we get to audio and video, but just remember uh, to reuse anything you've created. So another really great resource I want to share uh, is from the 2017 Learning Solutions Conference, um, and you can go out and look on this at the eLearning Guild 
website, uh, but there's a great PDF, uh, and I'll go a little bit, I'll click on it so we can see a little bit more full screen. Um, so in addition to the tips I've shared, uh, here's a really great worksheet that you can uh, get and use. Uh, go out to the website and find it. I provided the link, uh, but you can see there's a lot of information when formatting, uh, when talking about how to create the scripts. Uh, this is a handy little sheet that I wanted to share with us. So. So talking about scripts and projects, let's go to our last question, Polina, which is uh, let's talk about some of the wins or ouch moments on re-edits. Polina, should, are you, you muted? Be, yeah, I'm sorry. You should be seeing my screen now. Okay. So let's talk about scripts and projects. So have any of you, do you have any wins or any ouch moments that you'd like to share with the group and discuss or even specific questions about how the script writing process or the rewrites or the re-records have probably negatively affected your projects, but do you, anyone have any, uh, you know, like great moments to share? Here's how you avoided, uh, you know, the scope creep. So I'll continue to talk about this as we answer that question in the chat. Yes, and I also wanted to mention that we would also like to share, I mean, as we're going to um, make a blog post about this webinar, we would love to include your tips in this post, if you guys don't mind, of course. So thanks for sharing. <laughs> right, fantastic. Okay, let me go back to my screen while we answer that question. So, Polina, please jump in as we finish up here. Um, there we go, show my screen. All right, so talking about scripts and projects, so again, I can kind of jokingly say, you know, scripts are either in scope, and guess what the next slide is, out of scope. So remember, as we try to keep our, our script writing, and I say script, whether it's audio scripts or whether it's on-screen, um, you know, cr crafting and creation and authoring, rewrites and re-records happen, as I mentioned. They just will happen. And if they don't, then that's one of the times they don't, and, and that you're lucky on that time, but I would bet your next project they do happen. So we want to make sure that we create our authoring or our uh, narration scripts early in the development process to make sure we have time for these re-records and re-edits. Um, and we're ensuring that each and every phase of the timeline has enough padding when we get that back. And so that'll keep our scopes in script, or at least try to. Again, we're mitigating uh, possibilities. And of course, like I said, out of scope, what happens? Well, this is why we have padding. Uh, when you have re-records, uh, when at the last minute uh, you know, a SME or a stakeholder or someone realizes that information isn't succinct enough or isn't correct, um, we have to go back in, we, get, we have to um, rewrite it. Um, sometimes these includes uh, things outside of our control. If we have a lot of translations that have to occur for our content, uh, perhaps there was a typographical error in the translation we sent out and got back. Same thing with localizations. So if we don't plan these things, the you know if we don't plan for these things or understand that they happen, we quickly have a uh, out of scope or a scope creep that occurs because of either the on-screen content or the text part of the narration. So uh, these can also uh, include things like the closed caption. As I mentioned, you would take the baseline script you wrote and use it for the closed captioning. Uh, we would need to reformat that in some cases, uh, especially if you use the spacing or pausing uh, for transcripts or for any other assistive technology. So remember, these quickly go in and out of scope. So Polina, do we have any other uh, information to share on the feedback? I'm just reading through all of it, and I think it's fascinating. And um, some people say that it took them a while to learn how to use the audio, meaning mic, for recording. And um, some say that script writing, editing is very time-consuming, so they spend more time with them with that than the actual e-learning. That's yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? So it's very interesting that sometimes. And I say that because as we looked at in week one, the overall e-learning process of creating, you know, uh, e-learning content is quite robust. There's a lot of steps. So as we just got a comment, sometimes just this part of creating the script or narration uh, for this individual has taken longer than creating the entire e-learning process. So as you can see, things quickly get out of hand. So we need to mitigate these uh, as we talk about it. Um, let me sum up, but as I do, I want us to invite everyone to uh, discuss and ask specific questions. What we talked about today, of course, is, is looking at ways, 
at writing for screens, and of, course, and of course that includes chunking, which we probably all know, keeping things simple and concise, and making sure that we have probably robust information that needs to be distilled down into consumable, consumable chunks for our learner. Uh, and we also talked about creating items and previewing them so they see we see how they look on mobile de devices uh, first and making sure that content is the focus uh, and it looks good on the lowest common de denominator device. So uh, we also talked about things about writing for narration. I shared some resources online you can view, which I hope help. Uh, but we need to make sure that what we see or what we hear rather um, can be turned off if need be or muted or at least uh, put to the side and the learner still gets the information. Remember the audio needs to support and augment and enhance what we see on screen but not be overboard, not read word for word. Um, and so some other things we talked about is making sure that you plan for each and every one of these mitigative steps that you need to do uh, because redos and re-edits happen uh, and we just don't want any scope creep. So it can happen if not watch. So let's open it up for discussion. Uh, I wanted us to talk about this today. Paulina, are there any juicy um, tidbits over there? Well, I love, I actually love all of them. And one of them is from Alexandria. For our company, we have found having a quality microphone is the biggest help. It makes the clearest sound and picks up fantastic audio. Recordings we used in the past with just computer audio was not the best quality. And then Emily says that convincing the subject matter expert that a script was actually needed. Ouch, until they created one. And so I'll go back. So I, let me pick up on that last part first. So sure. I, w I would suggest no matter if it's your SME, if it's yourself, record that individual, say, okay, that's great. Let's see what you have to say and let's do a, a practice session. Get your phone out, get whatever device out you have, you know, your webcam and, and you know, your laptop. Have them sit down and, and talk uh, and then play that for them just, you know, just right there, then and there and ask them their true feelings. So I think a lot of us, many times, if you remember, you know, we don't sound the same as we think we do speaking. For instance, if you hear a recording of your own voice, you're like, that's not me. So I think that's a great point. If we, if we show someone what they can create just off the fly, it may help support our case for, hey, this was really good. And here's how we can make it better with a script. Did you hear how many times you said, um, uh, did you hear that the pacing was off? Um, you know, that sort of thing. So that's great. And so previous to that, um, this comment was what, Polina? Because I had a point I wanted to make about that. Oh, the microphone. So next week we'll also be talking about some tips and tricks. So that's an excellent point that the microphone and the equipment itself is vastly important to have quality learning. No one wants to hear scratchy, staticky, dogs barking in the background sort of uh, information. So that's why I said make sure you get in a quiet place. And also, as we'll talk about next week, the equipment is just as important. And any of you that have edited audio know and have put the ear, you know earphones on and listened to it, there's a lot of background noise that we just don't hear. Uh, and making sure that ambient noise isn't part of our learning and part of our, our audio output and final deliverable is very important. So that's good. Thank you. Yeah, and I have the best question ever from Carrie. What in the world is your mug? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. Um, it's a, I don't know if anyone has seen, you know, Cartoon Network's Adult Swim Rick and Morty. This is a Rick and Morty mug. So uh, <laughs> thank you for, thank you for my, the mug appreciation. So um, awesome. yeah, so this is something we picked up at a uh, Comic-Con recently. Not the Comic-Con, but a comic book convention. <laughs> All right, so we do have more questions. Um, any tips on interjecting energy like a radio DJ? Well, and so that's, that's, that's also a um, item. So just like a radio DJ can be just right, or can be rather cheesy as they talk about what's coming up next on the radio. Hi, you're the first caller, what's your name? <laughs> so there can be a difference. So interjecting energy energy can be done in script. But remember when I talked about the benefit of good at getting a voiceover artist, sometimes you get someone with the voice that sounds really good, that it's comfortable, that puts people at ease and allows them to receptively, um, you know, get information. Um, some of that has to do with your, your actual voiceover artist. If it's you, I would suggest you do some recordings and let someone else listen to it. Uh, ask them, does this sound exciting enough? If it's a specific person or SME that you you need to capture their information, maybe interject with some, you know, and again, some of us have 
or are very monotone. I've been accused of being very monotone. Um, and so interjecting a, a long voiceover with, for me and, and chopping it up into little chunks, uh, again, chunking, and providing on-screen graphics that support that, that can pr provide some excitement. There's all sorts of ways to do it, but again, it depends on the voice and timbre of your specific voiceover artist. Hopefully, we'll get someone that is good. And we talk a little bit about that next week, about choosing your voiceover artist, but um, that's an interesting question. There's several ways we can add a little bit more interaction and interest in, in our voiceover. So very good. All right. And uh, moving on to the next question from Stephanie. How do you get the audio to sound right if re-recording at a later date and your voice doesn't seem the same? Well, that's when, uh, you know, of course, we start with good recording equipment, hopefully. Um, and sometimes it kind of, it's just the way it is. Sometimes it will sound slightly different. Um, dividing that up, um, say we have one re-record on one slide and another on another, the interspersing of time between the two recordings sometimes helps. But, you know, our learners, just like us, are probably pretty intelligent. They can probably hear the difference. So beyond all that, I would say uh, there's many ways to edit it to adjust the sound levels. Um, and so if you have a good audio person, um, lean on them for some help to help sound make them sound similar. They may not. As again, I mentioned, even voices themselves, never mind the ambient noise, can sound a little different from day to day. We can be a little bit more nasally. We can have dry lips. Anything can happen. So understand that. Um, so do your best. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there are ways to edit audio uh, to make sure the sound levels are the same. And that helps making sure things are uh, not too loud or too soft compared to a previous recording. Just know that it happens um, and try to mitigate that next time. But again, some of these tips might help spacing it out between slides and or making sure that you have good equipment to start with or a good audio person or a good editing program you can use. Awesome. Thank you very much. And we do have a question about text-to-speech, a couple of them. Is text-to-speech recommended? And what's your take on using text-to-speech computer voices? That's interesting. And I didn't cover it on this one, uh, but I certainly have used um, text-to-speech uh, text before speech, sorry, uh, TTS. So um, it's, it's an interesting, I leverage it sometimes in the pre-writing when I'm getting feedback rather than, um, you know, having an actual voiceover artist come in uh, and do the script. I may say, hey, here's this done in TTS. Uh, here's the audio files. They're more or less 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 30 seconds. And so that allows someone to begin uh, if they're doing, you know, say, uh, you know, making sure that the on-screen content is timed with that. That helps with timings. Um, but I would say if your learner is okay with that sound, then that's fine. Uh, if the content is, is also um, jives with that, use it. That's fine. Um, I would suggest looking into either a little bit higher end or better sounding uh, text-to-speech voices. Uh, and there are some free uh, resources out there. Uh, that you can use there there are you know Microsoft voice is the standard but it really depends on your learner uh, what they're okay with and what you are okay with so and some of those can sound pretty decent so I would investigate those it so just to get down to your question it can be a viable resource whether in the pre-development pre, you know resource or later on in the finished product it just depends on you and can you recommend any text-to-speech Services. I have used some, um, some, I'll have to see the link. I think it's just something simple like free text to speech. Uh, but again, I normally use those only to get sort of uh, buy in and feedback from stakeholders uh, and SMEs and others on the early development process. Uh, I don't have any that I necessarily recommend right now as far as voices because it depends a little bit on location. Um, you know, for instance, those of you know there are different dialects. What may work for the Americas may not work, you know, may not be relevant relatively um, or readily accepted in the UK or others. So it just depends. Right. And uh, we have a couple of questions about the text um, versus narration. Should you then have on the screen everything that you have in the narration? Right. So I would make it available um, as, as wanted or needed. So my, my initial answer is no, you should not. I would say the most important information be it little blurbs or, you know, little pockets or chunks of text needs to be on screen. 
But if the learner wants that information, we provide links. For instance, um, if there is a policy that we're covering, uh, we talk about the main points of the policy or what's changed since the last policy, but we normally give that person a link to a PDF or an online document where they can sit down and take the 14 hours to read that document. So it's the same sort of thing. You know, in audio, we are enhancing and, and giving a conversational level and also hitting for our auditory learners what they could potentially see on screen. If they want that information, we can possibly provide it. But I would, my initial recommendation is no. Uh, but then again, that can change for learner to learner or content to content. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And a question from Sandy. Do you have standard for how long we should expect a student to be engaged with one presentation or activity? I don't have a standard. That's a pretty good question. So um, it, it really depends. So uh, when we talk about interactive, you know, different interactive things, um, engagement and learner interactivity is, is a unique balance. And we'll talk about that a little bit later um, in the coming weeks when we talk about branching scenarios and such and interactivity. Um, but it really depends. So let's even take it down to smaller, you know, so slide by slide if you're using, you know, PowerPoint uh, verbiage. Um, so relatively speaking, depending on how much information, you you'd probably say that one slide equals one minute of learner time. It can be more, but probably no, not much more usually because we want that learner to move on and have other information. Uh, sitting on a, a, a screen as a learner for more than a minute seems like forever. Um, so that, that's, for now, that's, uh, you know, just a conversationally speaking one rule. I would say maybe even less. Yeah, less than a minute per screen or per interactivity, but it really depends. As I just mentioned, if the learner wants more information, we certainly want to allow them to dig deeper and dive deeper. Um, so it really depends on what the content is and, and how robust it is. Thanks a lot. And the next question is from Kieran. Is it helpful to have multiple voices do narration throughout the learning or better to stick with the same voice? Well, I'll, I'll give you my personal preference. I would prefer to have one voice narrate a slide-by-slide -slide or however it is, interaction or e-learning content. And now that's my preference. But I, I may want to turn that audio off at some point. But also, let's say uh, if I have a avatar-led or a coach-led, uh, you know, sort of mentor on screen of my e-learning content, I would want a different voice for that than I would want for the narration or vice versa. So. It depends on the content. Um, again, when I was talking about doing training for air traffic controllers, they actually preferred a little bit of variety. They preferred one narrator for this concept, another narrator for this concept, but that wasn't the norm. I think typically speaking, more than likely you, you would want one, but again, if your learners like that and they're okay with that, go for more. Um, it, you don't have to do anything a certain way in order to make it successful. And that's one thing we want to make sure. Remember when last week when I said we want to be advocates for our learner, we want to make sure that they're happy, they're comfortable, and they like what we do. And there's no easy way to do that other than just going out and getting more information from our learners. So. Perfect. Thank you. And if you could let me read um, some of the tips that um, our attendees have shared. Oh, one, please do. One from Laura. I have advice. When recording and you mess up, just pause, then start again. No need to stop and start recording. In edit, you search for the big pause indicated by the sound bars, and you can edit it out, which I think is uh, great advice. Thank you very much, Laura, for sharing that. That's very good. And also another one is from Darian. My voice sounds better late morning or afternoon. Never first thing in the morning. Never first thing in the morning, especially after a long or good weekend, so to speak. All right. <laughs> okay, and the next question is from Marita. I have a primitive mic that does the job, but it isn't the best. I record in my best basement when it's quiet, but it still picks up quiet air sound. Is there a tip trick to making sure my mic doesn't pick that up? So that's a good information. So like I mentioned earlier, I used to do it in my walk-in closet. So perhaps in your basement, and, and who knows, you know, I don't know how your basement is set up, but let's say there are other items in it. Let's say it, it might not have carpet. Anything you can do to dampen that noise uh, would be helpful. Bring in some heavy jackets. Bring in some heavy clothes. They are already on hangers. Hang them up in different locations. Put them around the mic. Um, I don't think I can reach mine, but you can, of course, get the pop filters. 
um, which again, and, and for those of you who know what I'm talking about, it's usually a circular looking little piece of mesh that you put in front of your microphone. Um, or even as you can see on my, you know, on mine, I have a little mouthpiece, you know, pop mic. So anything you can do to mitigate the sound, but also remember as you edit noise um, and depending on your editor, and, and I believe in iSpring, you can actually edit out some of that ambient noise as well. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's quite beneficial as well. You, you pick up, you know, as someone just mentioned, you have that little pause, you pick up that space and the editor, and we'll talk about the editing tips and tricks next week. But those are some things you can do right now, at least, uh, to help the ambient noise be cut down. Uh, and so, as you all know, as the microphone tries to pick up not only your voice, it picks up everything usually, even if it's you know uh, unit on the directional or whatever. Uh, so, cutting down on the amount of noise or uh, bounce back or echoes in the room would help quite a bit, I bet. Right, and we have. Um... A tip from Darren, use a directional microphone, AKG D5. And another one from Randy, a good place to record is in a vehicle in a, gar in a garage uh, for a totally soundproof environment. How cool is that? <laughs> that's fantastic. I would have never thought of that. So that's, that's good. And, and notice, just like I mentioned, we have a small contained space. Depending on your car, there's probably a lot of upholstery and things that soak up the sound. So that's a great piece of advice. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and then just a quick one from Carl. Film cover and you have to have pop filters. All right, and moving on to our questions. One from Stuart. Our videos are of software demos. How much narration should we use to describe the action of the cursor? Oh, that's interesting. And so that also talks about how much information you might need to describe for those assistive technology users. So um, it, it, okay, unfortunately it depends, and I say that a lot. So let's say it's just something that is click here, click here, and then click here, and then the screen comes up, whether or not you have to input information. Um, so it, I would do a couple of tests. I would provide one that's bare bones with no audio um, or even such little audio as see the following animation or, or see the on-screen cursor, see how it looks versus create one that has piece by piece audio that is interspersed in. Uh, I would wager a guess that the learner probably is okay with just seeing the on-screen uh, information. But again, remember, you may need to describe that information uh, for those that use assistive technology or what have you. So that's a good question. Um, I, I would say, just generally speaking, that you don't necessarily need as much audio in that case because you see the visual of what's happening. But it depends. All right. Thank you very much. And um, sorry, I just lost it. But we do have a very nice um, Another another tip from Carrie, although a little different from what you're talking about, I like to use Siri to record what I want to say, then copy the text into a doc and edit the language grammar for a script. Is that great? Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's capturing the, the text with your voice, and that way you have to type less, but you're just uh, fixing it up later. I think that's fantastic, so that's great. And so also it, helping... Uh, you know, have Siri read it back, and I know that's a little bit more involved, but allowing you to sort of hear how it sounds, and again, the text-to-speech reader, uh, seeing how it sounds, that's a great point. So, Right, and uh, moving on to a question from Laura. Let's say you have a slide with several on-screen animations flying in and out, timed to audio. Then you have to re-record a piece. In this case, we would need to import the new audio for that piece. Can we simply replace one chunk of timing on that slide? Or does the entire slide need to have its timers reset? That's a good question. So I, let's say we're doing it in something like PowerPoint where we have a specific timeline. Depending on how you have the animation set up, um, you can have them fire off one dependent of the other. Um, so hopefully you've set it up where you only have to do that part. And again, that's um, sort of a broad question that goes beyond today's discussion, but um, doing things as setting, uh, you know, so one fires off uh, the animation and then you have the next animation set or whatever it is fire off after, but it has a delay uh, or at the same time, but has a delay, you'd only need to adjust that one section. Hopefully we have set these up where, you know, it's only section by section, but unfortunately you're going to get in situations where you really have to do each and every tiny little nuance part of the animation. And that's part of it. And that's, again, part of what you need to think about, both as you're creating the animations, but as you're including time 
for the redos, the re-edits, and in this case, the reanimation because of the subsequent re-record. Um, so think about how you set those up uh, initially, and hopefully you can mitigate some of that. But it happens, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Mike. And a question from Divya. When you say one minute per slide, how many words on that slide? Not very many. So <laughs> it, it really depends. Um, and so I would hopefully say that, and that was just a guesstimate, by the way, I would hopefully say that one slide would not be more than one minute unless, as someone mentioned earlier, there's that uh, software simulation or interface simulation that happens where someone needs to see maybe a robust set of clicks or, or mousings. Um, so depending on what you're looking at, if it's a standard what I call level two, if those of you that remember our discussion from week one, uh, which is beyond page turner but not quite in the immersive simulation 3D world, um, you would have text and audio or video or an image. So I can't give you a specific number, um, but we definitely don't want to do, say, you know, more than two or three paragraphs. And again, I'm using that term loosely because these wouldn't be full robust paragraphs you would see in a newspaper article or on screen. They just need to have the succinct information because, again, maybe our audio is covering that information within that one minute, or maybe the learner is doing an interaction, clicking something and being active at that point. So uh, it's hard to say, but, but literally not much text, just enough to get a very concise and very succinct message across to our learner about what they're seeing on screen. And we have a comment from Johanka. I use the sync tool in iSpring when I need to correct timing after. So this will be, I guess, in manage narration. Oh, right, in the manage narration. So that's a great tool as well. So, And that may help alleviate what the other person was talking about, about all the animations and timings. And again, using that narration, you, and depending on how you set it up, that was a pretty smart way to do it. So good choice. Right. Thank you very much for mentioning it. Mentioning it, and we have another tip from Fern. Another tip I got to make editing easier is to clap or snap your fingers to make a blip in the audio file. It helps to make it easy to find the place where you want to add it or remove. I have to be honest with you all. When I do my voiceover recordings, I do the same thing, but uh, I pop my lips, and so I see it visually <laughs> on the the audio indicator. I can't tell you how many of those pops I have edited out of my over and over and over, take three, take six, take nine. And so that's a fantastic way to do that. And if you have a second camera set up, which many of you may not, but if you do, that clap or that loud noise will also allow you to sync things up in the editor. So that's a fantastic point. So it sounds like someone's an old AV editor in there. So. Right. And um, question from David, what are the recommended font sizes for the screen text? Ah, that's a great information. So I don't have them in front of me. I will probably be sharing those later in that week where I talked about UI and UX. I specifically talk about on-screen font sizes. You can go out and Google it. There's a lot of great information, uh, and it's, it's gotten even better in the last few years, specifically when we talk about fonts that look good on small screen and, and big screen. Uh, and I'll share those later in the coming weeks. But uh, um, I don't have those tips directly in front of me, but um, I, you know it's it's pretty readily found out there. So, right. Okay, well, at this point, I think we need to wrap up our webinar session. And we do have some more comments and tips shared from our by our users. I'm sorry, by our attendees. So um, we will be releasing a blog post on that webinar session, and we will be definitely including some of the tips in there so that you can guys feel that um, ice, other icebringers are sharing their knowledge with you. And also, I would like to. Um, share a link with all of you. I will post it in the chat section right now. Uh, so here's the page where you are more than welcome to submit any other questions that you have. And um, sometime later, Michael will take care of that and get back to you with the answers to your questions. Right. right. So fantastic. Right? Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yes, no, certainly. Yep. And then I also wanted to remind you that you can win the face-to-face -face online consultation with Michael, either 60 minutes, 45 minutes, or 30 minutes. If you just simply answer the question, what did you learn at the webinars? And then post it under the 
general blog post on our website and I have shared the link to it in the chat section as well. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Are you excited, so, Michael? <laughs> I, I'm very excited. So please feel free to jump on there, everyone. Um, chat with us, uh, push your questions on for the blog posts and such, and really get interactive with these webinars. That's what we want, is to have a whole lot of discussion from everyone. So thank you, for everyone, for participating. Yep, and I hope you guys enjoyed this session. You're more than welcome to submit your feedback in the comment section and let us know what you like, what you maybe didn't like. And I saw some points, uh, I'm sorry, some people mentioning that we have a misspelled world, word on one of the slides. So we better do a better job with you, Michael, for our next webinar. Fantastic. Remember when I said everyone get send it out for feedback and QA. So that's exactly <laughs> what I needed to do in that case. <laughs> All right. So I would like to thank you, Michael, one more time for speaking for our attendees today. Yes. Thank you for having me. And thank you for iSpring for doing this webinar series. I really appreciate it. All right, and we will see you guys next week. And what are we going to talk about? Oh, let's pull up that slide. Hang on. <laughs> let's take a look at what we're talking about. I believe so. it will be tips and tricks for audio and video narration and editing. Right, here it is on screen in case anyone needs it. But yes, so week four, tips and tricks. So we'll be looking at specific ways to capture and edit what we've done. And a lot of it we talked about today, but we'll also get into the trenches on how to do it. So. All right, so uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day, and we'll see you at the next web webinar. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you again, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Everyone.